In this last part of the Consciously Hybrid series, we continue to explore South Africa's relationship with cloud technologies. My name is Daniel. I travel the world discovering how cloud technologies are destined to shape the way we live and work. In this final episode of Consciously Hybrid, we're talking strategy. We explore how South African technologists are moving government services forward. The comfort zone that we're in has come to an end. The reality is that business strategy could change in the next two to three years. I, I can't see a, a scenario where we are totally reliant on cloud technologies. The comfort zone that we're in has come to an end and that I have to now create a new knowledge base independent of everybody else. That's the key thing about new knowledge, is what is it not? Because the hype will tell you what is and what it may be and what that edge to what is not can be very, very, very big and blurry and increases all the time. Our policies often say that link your IT strategy to your business strategy. The reality is that business strategy could change in the next two to three years, but the mandate of the business is in actual fact what it needs to deliver against. And if you realign your strategy to that mandate of the organization, you can still tweak it to say that, well, for this financial year, or for the next three years, we'd like to achieve these 10 things. We can still achieve that. But if you've written it against what the mandate is, you achieve a much greater outcome than what you are doing for the year and now. And uh, those kind of skills and that kind of knowledge becomes vitally important for that, I want to say, the technologist to move to an IT technology visionary rather than just being a technologist. Should they go a big bang approach and a total public cloud first uh, type of offering? My opinion is no. I think more a pragmatic approach would be to be able to look at perhaps smaller applications or some, uh, how can I say it, office productivity type applications, put them into the public cloud, let them live there and understand that environment before you actually take a big bang approach and try to move it all up. Because that's just unrealistic. I think that's uh, something that a lot of our government departments are stuck in at the moment and they're trying to really say, okay, how do we take this whole landscape over there? It's not going to work. Some must go live there, some must be on premise, do it slowly. In my view, is a hybrid inevitable? I think a hybrid is the right thing to do. I, I mean, hybrid and multi. Even if you're in public cloud, right, I think you should uh, go multi-cloud uh, for, 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 for things, there are a lot of reasons for that. And I think you should also um, stake your cloud horizontally as well, meaning have certain things um, on-prem, maybe certain things on the edge and certain uh, capabilities uh, in the public cloud. I mean, there are different reasons for that. If I'm in the manufacturing plant and it's mission critical, time critical, and outage critical, I don't really want to take everything into the public cloud. We're having a conversation today about how fair and transparent things should be. And I was saying, sometimes when you're fair and transparent, you still discriminate because you're going to say, I de-risk, so I need to take a cloud solution provider that is proven, all right, versus a new cloud service provider that has no uh, record. But at the same time, disruptors normally don't have record, isn't it? Um, if there's a best cloud provider who does not have record but is a cloud disruptor, okay, who might have the best solution, is not going to get an opportunity to present the best solution for us. We, we have to actually manage the risk. We have to say, let's test new stuff. For example, Azure in our environment has been proven to say it works very well, all right? But it's very expensive and relative to what the other market providers come with. But those are not tested. And them not being tested, how do you get to test them? So it's always handy that you, you can stick with what you have, but introduce the new players so that you can see their capability. You introduce them as a pilot, you introduce them as a proof of concept. If they go beyond a certain point, move more workloads, test, see how it performs. But I think we're always going to be hybrid in our approach. I, I can't see a, a scenario where we are 
totally reliant on cloud technologies. It's just not the nature of what we do. There are certain amount, there are certain services that we deliver, certain data that we, 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 we are responsible for that would simply just not be exposed in, in, in terms of the cloud. And we're looking at different approaches. We've, in, in the Directive and Determination, we speak about uh, government private cloud uh, as something that the state IT agency must develop for us as a collective, where we can trust that uh, this is a, a, a service where we can store our sensitive data. So I think the, the general uh, response to the Determination and Directive has been positive. Uh, in fact, from a compliance perspective, we are struggling to keep up with the, the, uh, the amount of submissions that we are getting from departments and agencies that have started to use cloud. And I must say that we have not created a, uh, a situation where we are gatekeepers for the decisions. While we have uh, published the determination and directive on cloud usage, the decision ultimately lies with accounting officers and directors general in departments and agencies who are responsible for the services that they deliver at the, in, at the end of the day. Uh, ours is to ensure that when it's done, it's done in a responsible manner, that departments have taken into consideration the, the risks, the issues of the data sovereignty, the issues of data location, the issues of privacy, uh, and of course all of the other uh, risks that arise out of the cloud adoption. Departments are clearly thinking carefully about the risks of adoption and planning their strategies. But this can often be lengthy and complex. I had learned that there seems to be some friction between how cloud is sold and how cloud is used. This further highlights to me the importance of finding a technology partner that shares similar priorities and values. Hopefully this will continue to help drive South Africa's progress into the fourth industrial revolution. Yeah, I must say that uh, I've been approached and uh, with my other peer group members, they've confirmed a number of you know, cloud-based providers. The approach at the moment, it's more about how we can save your capital cost because they are aware that many of the OEMs that we're dealing with when it comes to maintenance, support. The messaging is always say that I have a better offering because it's more about economy of scale. In my environment, it's less when it comes to issues of energy provisioning and issues of support. And I can guarantee you 24 by seven type support, 365 days. Now, when you listen to that message, then it becomes important to say that if I were to review my business model, at the moment, what is actually my biggest cost in this whole value chain? Is it operational cost when it comes to my staff, my technical team? Because before I can even decide to go somewhere else, I need to do my situational analysis internally to say, I've got three engineers that are managing my data center. Now, do I have to redeploy those individuals if I were to take my storage to somewhere else? I find that when you start talking that language, they shy away when it comes to when you say, look, does this mean a, you know, a job reduction strategy for my team? Because I've got people that have been taking care of my data center. I don't get a feeling that that's a priority. You know, when you're selling, it's all about your commission. It's about your brand positioning. But the minute you talk about, can I integrate my resources with your strategy? It's a language that it's not being engaged. And I personally, as Mutibi, I've given a challenge to many of those that comes to me to say, as much as I believe and I support cloud, how would are you going to integrate my resources into your work plan. Because from a skills parting and skills development transfer, it cannot just be a one stop where now I'm now disadvantaged when it comes to my own resources. But what is imp interesting, it's from a cost point of view. I, I find that many of them as well, they don't read our annual reports to see where our pain points. And I keep telling some of them to say, you know, before you come to me, 
Just read my annual report. Listen to my chairperson and my commissioner in this instance. What are they saying? What are the pain points? So that when you're going to be talking about reducing issues to me, there's issues of licenses. Now, if my current license fee structure with the current OEM, it's exorbitant amount, bring those elements because I'm a businessman as well. You know, CIOs, we're no longer just, just IT people, but we are strategists. So I find that when you start talking strategy, they shy away because, you know, you're talking to a salesperson who just think that we just want to buy. That was a case in point when we started a SEP project. We started the SEP project with on-prem and um, the on-prem it was its own, had its own disasters. Uh, the, the, the workloads were very high initially and we needed infrastructure that is very expensive, so we had to chunk it. Uh, but then the project team that we was working with also um, actually forced us to have uh, a number of cloud servers at the, at the same time. And I had emphasized to say, no, you, the reason you're going cloud is rise per size, meaning that you will need certain workloads when you get to a certain stage of the project. And uh, they insisted, and they were given that, but later to find that they didn't need all that because those workloads, we actually switched them off and we saved a lot of money, more than, uh, I think, more than 30% of the cost, you know, that were, were, were saved. So it's very, very, very important to know what you are doing before you can start with the cloud journey. And it's always handy to kind of pilot it and also do it as rise per size. You can take a long-term project, uh, you make sure that the investment is over a long time because the amortization becomes cheaper even for the cloud provider. Um, then your cost of ownership becomes less. What else if you take in shorter periods, it becomes more expensive. So you have to strike a balance to say how much do you take upfront and then for how long do you take that? So I find that uh, moving into cloud, we have to take it over a lot longer period, more than three years, okay, to, to make sure that we get the investment. But the important thing is not to take the total capacity at a go. You take it as you need that capacity. And you also need a flexible cloud solution provider. At least be able to do it quarterly and those kind of things that you can re recalibrate the costing and also decide how much workloads do you want additional and how much do you need less. A tough conversation I'm having with my chief information officers is when they have this novel idea and a strategy to move to public cloud and they go ahead and they buy uh, these cloud services ahead of time, uh, many of them don't realize that if you don't use the service, you lose the service. So if you buy, you take any contract and you don't consume that service at the term of that contract, you lose that, right? And so that now introduces a new concept around fruitless and wasteful expenditure, right? Which becomes very interesting. And uh, we have some ways around how we're helping our customers by bringing the cloud to them and then connecting it to some of these services to try and avoid uh, these audit findings that our customers are, are faced with. There are plenty of professionals who are both being wise and conscious about decision-making in cloud. But I wanted to know what type of citizen services can benefit from a data-first approach. I always say, I love my grandmother to bits. She was about 97 when she passed on. But the one thing that I could never stand is the fact that within the environment we grew up in, my grandmother had to, if she had to go and see a physician at her local hospital, she would need to get up at four o'clock in the morning to go and stand in queue at five and hope that she might be serviced by four o'clock the afternoon. And this was in the 90s, and there's still many others that are going through the same cycle. And at some point I went, but this is absolutely ludicrous. We have capability, um, but we are not responding to the needs. So therefore, understand the need. In actual fact, I don't even want to use the term, um, put yourself in somebody else's shoes, because uh, I generally say that, um, you know, I don't want to catch any fungus. So I'd rather not wear your shoes, but I'd go into the experience, have an immersive experience of what the challenges are. And if you understand the challenges, you are then better able to respond to what those needs are. 
And if that is anything to go by, I think that would really change an organization in terms of how it delivers services. In actual fact, it will change how government provides services to its citizens. And uh, if that is any value in gold, that would be my key advice to um, any technologist trying to change and uh, kind of move from a technologist to that visionary component that they need to be. I think if the public sector gets their digital transformation agenda right, I think there's a, there's a lot of opportunities that can come out of that. Um, I think one, just you know, having a, a better citizen experience, um, you know, that frees up uh, productivity back into the economy. Uh, so in the South African context, we have a lot of um, uh, time wastage. For example, if you go to a home affairs office and you want to, you know, renew your 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 passport book and the like, and the amount of time that that takes, uh, we often see queues uh, around the country where people are waiting to do that. Uh, so just various administrative things uh, that one has to get done. Uh, that just take more time than is necessary, right, given that we are in 2023. And so I think, you know, opportunities to release that productivity back into the economy and help people driving economic growth as opposed to, you know, waiting around in lines, I think cannot be underestimated. And I think the mistake we often make is we believe that engaging with the CEO of an organization or engaging with the minister of a department is your primary source of information. And it's not because it might be the strategic direction, but the actual nuts and bolts is engaging with different lines of business, engaging with, um, and I often say is that, you know, within any organization, if you want to get the, um, you know, the nitty gritty of things going on, the best person to speak to is the messenger or the cleaner, because nobody takes note of the cleaner cleaning your office. In the interim, the cleaner hears all your conversations because they're there, they, this unobtrusive, um, you know, presence. But uh, if you want to know the, um, you know, the, the soap opera detail, go and speak to the cleaner and you'll find out a lot more about the organization um, than what you actually think. So I think the one stance is to, to get a pure knowledge of what it is that the organization really needs. Uh, have a, a vision as to what that organization would look like in the next five to 10 years and then develop a strategy around achieving that five-year or 10-year view. Uh, my advice to public sector technologists would always be, I never start with the technology. Always start with the client and the problem that you're trying to solve. Uh, I think far too often we, um, you know, we chase technologies because we have budgets to spend um, and we bring them in and they actually you know, add more confusion uh, because you've got the new one, you've got the old one, it's not quite integrated properly, et cetera, and then no one knows what to do with this, with this new thing. Um, so I'd always say never ever start with the technology, always start with the business problem that, we, that you're trying to solve and then work backwards. I try to stay away from a lot of terms like digitization and uh, modernization journeys because uh, uh, frankly, they make me a little bit sick. Um, I think every single department wants to modernize themselves or digitize, but what does that mean? because they're just used really so, so loosely. I'm excited to see the uptake uh, in terms of the technology. I think we've turned a corner where uh, traditionally uh, leaders in our organizations, public sector organizations had to be convinced about the need for technology. And now we are starting to see that the leaders are demanding the technology. And it's a little bit scary from our perspective because it's difficult for us as the technology implementers to keep up with that demand. But I think it's necessary that the pressure is, 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 is put on the technology leaders in departments and the implementers to, to start to, to, to implement that technology a bit quicker. And so the opportunity of cloud, the opportunity that cloud brings, particularly in my view, the software as a service aspect of it, I think is, 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 is the most exciting part for me. I think for me, technology, it's one way where I can see that it can bring a new fresh air to the next generation. And if we can collaborate and find ways of working together, we'll just be one world, one country, where we don't have borders. This is the end of my journey in South Africa. The opportunity of data and cloud technologies to help advance the fourth industrial revolution is exciting. We learned there are challenges and many of those are shared across the world. It is my hope that as we continue to develop our digital world, we share knowledge, experiences, and develop a fair and resilient future. 
South Africa's passion and conscious approach to technology is infectious. How it enters digital maturity will be a story we all want to watch.